the Yakovlev Yak-38. Or I guess, technically, the pronunciation should be Y-A-K-38, but I've never met a single human being that says Y-A-K. It's like with the MiGs. No one says M-I-G in their case. So Yak-38. It's whatever. This was a Soviet strike fighter aircraft developed in the early 70s. Its claim to fame is being the Soviet Union's first VTOL strike fighter to actually enter service. Much like the Hawker Sidley Harrier, it could take off and land vertically. And that is a tremendous benefit for a whole host of reasons. They had a crew of one, a length of 16.37 meters, a wingspan of 7.32 meters, a height of 4.25 meters, a maximum speed of 650 miles per hour, a range of 810 miles, a service ceiling of 36,000 feet, and they were powered by three engines. Which... What? Three? Let me explain. In order to achieve vertical flight, in the Yak-38's case, their normal, regular engine was a single Tumansky R-28 V-300 vectored thrust turbofan. But, for takeoff and landing vertically, they also employed two smaller Rybinsk RKBM RD-38 turbojet engines. It was a unique setup to achieve this, and... It, um... Okay, here's the thing about the Yak-38. Especially when compared to its major contemporary, the Harrier, the Yak-38 left a lot to be desired. It really wasn't a very good plane, um, for a whole host of reasons. Technically, it did achieve what they set out to do, because they were making a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, and, and yeah, it could do that. But it couldn't do much else. And that was kind of the problem. The history of the Yak-38 goes back to a completely different Yakovlev design, the Yak-36. NATO reporting name, Freehand. As early as 1960, the Yakovlev Design Bureau was trying to create a VTOL aircraft. And as a concept, the VTOL thing dates back to the end of World War II. Even Germany was messing about with it. The 36 never entered service, though four were built and were meant to be technology demonstrators to iron out the kinks when it came to trying to create an aircraft that did this. The Harrier, for a long time, was pretty much the only successful example of this setup because, frankly, it's just a pain in the butt to get working. But despite all the technical hurdles surrounding it, the benefits spoke for themselves. I mean, technically speaking, you wouldn't need a runway. At all. It would have the benefits of a helicopter, but with the speed of a plane. Originally, the design was designated Yak-104, and it was going to be a converted Yak-30 jet trainer, featuring two vertically mounted RU-19 engines between the inlet ducts. But they threw that out the window, because frankly, it wasn't really that great. Instead, favoring an aircraft with a single-lift cruise engine, fitted with rotating nozzles, which would have been remarkably similar to the Harrier prototype, the P.1127. However, the Soviets didn't actually have access to an engine that could achieve this in any reasonable way, and the government wasn't interested in pushing for the development of a new engine that could meet the needs of this particular design. So Yakovlev had to get a bit more creative. Instead, the new proposal, which was submitted in 1961, was for a twin-engined aircraft with a very large nose air intake, as well as engines fitted in the forward fuselage and swiveling exhaust nozzles. They did complete four of the prototypes, though it was never entered into production. The first tethered flight occurred on January 9th, 1963. And they ran into problems almost immediately, which isn't unusual for something this ambitious. The hot gases that were being sent out for the hover test uh, had a habit of just going back into the engine, which is bad. You don't want it to do that. They were forced to make some modifications to try to iron this out. And the first untethered flight was made on June 23rd, 1963. And a prototype achieved a full transition into horizontal flight from vertical flight on September 16th that same year. Not bad. But the prototypes wouldn't complete the cycle, namely going from vertical flight to horizontal flight 
back to vertical flight and vertical landing until 1966. Work of the design continued, but eventually it was realized that, um, frankly, the design itself was kind of the problem. There was only so many modifications they could make without redesigning the whole thing. So basically, they just redesigned the whole thing. Officially, the Yak-38 does originate with the 36, but the 38, NATO reporting name Forger, wound up being a radically different design. While superficially very similar to the Harrier, mechanically, it does not work like the Harrier at all. Originally, it was designated the Yak-36M, and the first prototype was completed on April 14th, 1970. The way it achieved VTOL was through thrust vectoring in the rear, and those two smaller engines I mentioned are fitted in the front, side by side, and used only for takeoff and landing. In regular flight, they were just dead weight, which is a relevant issue that's gonna come up a bit later. Now, the real question you must be asking is, well, did it work? Oh yeah, it worked, and they entered service on August 11th, 1976. However, um, it, it was quickly found that the Forgers weren't really that good, all things considered. Certainly not when compared with the Harrier. In order to get this design to function, Yakovlev made a ton of compromises, probably way too many. The original version of the 38 didn't have any radar and was equipped with only four hard points. That sounds like very few, but to be fair, the reason there were only four is that the planes could only carry 4,400 pounds of ordnance, otherwise known as next to nothing. It didn't even have an internal machine gun. If it wanted to carry guns, it had to mount those on one of the hard points. Its range was also pretty trash too. It really couldn't go very far. Perfectly fine for defending the carriers they were stationed on. Also, nothing else. And when they were dispatched to Afghanistan, it was discovered that the engine arrangement uh, was really, really, really bad for high temperatures. The engines didn't like it at all. It was too hot, scary, no, and they just flat out didn't work. It was also likely at that point that many pilots became distinctly aware and deeply alarmed that if one of the lift jets broke, the other would keep going, which sounds good, except it would immediately cause a severe imbalance that would throw the aircraft completely out of whack and onto its side, where it would likely crash and die horribly. It, it, it just wasn't good. But don't worry, they thought of this and equipped the planes with an automatic ejection system, just in case something terrible happened. And on paper, that sounds great, but that system turned out to be way way too sensitive and would often th just chuck the pilots out of the planes even when they were still in control of it. It was a mess, but they did take steps to improve it. The Yak 38M, also designated Forger A, was an upgraded version that replaced the engines, improving the performance characteristics slightly. I say slightly because well, frankly, it only increased the total payload by like 2,000 pounds, which, okay, great. That's not super helpful, but it's it's better than where we were at. It was an improvement. It was. Objectively, it was. Not a great one, but it was. There was also the 38U, or the Forger B, which looks utterly ridiculous. And it is. But it was designed to have a two-seat cockpit, if it wasn't obvious. Regardless of the improvements, though, at the end of the day, the biggest issue with the 38s were that they just couldn't go far enough or carry enough ordnance to have the projection the Soviet Navy wanted. Whereas the Royal Harriers absolutely crushed it during the Falklands War, being one of the major deciding factors during that conflict, the 38s could never hope to achieve anything remotely like that. They just weren't relevant enough in a battlefield situation. Could they carry stuff and shoot it? Yes. But not far enough? And not, well, enough for it to really matter. But it wasn't like the Soviets weren't aware of the benefits of VTOL. I mean, the Harrier was proving it. They just needed a better version. And Yakovlev did push forward with a new design, known as the Yak-141, made a reporting name Freestyle. 
More of these would wind up being constructed and did, at first, seem to offer much, MUCH better performance than the 38s could ever hope to achieve. But their first flight was March 9th, 1987. And, um... <clears throat> yeah, that was... that was poor timing. With the Soviet Union's collapse, the project basically stood at a standstill, as did most Soviet weapons projects. Well, basically all of them, since now it was under Russia. Yakovlev did want to push forward, and once the Iron Curtain fell, even Lockheed stepped in to try to help them out with it, interestingly enough. But there just weren't enough available funds for the project. It wasn't going to happen. And eventually, the whole thing fell apart. Although two of the proposed production aircraft did actually survive. So, that's that's nice. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.